This is Friday, March 23rd, 2018. We are at the Bedford VA Medical Center, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Marion C. Sheridan. Welcome, Marion. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? 11 9 24. And where were you born? Melrose, Massachusetts. And do you currently live here at the Bedford VA? I, my home is the Bedford VA. Your marital status? Widow. Do you have children? Yes, I do, too. They are amazing young women. Do you have grandchildren? I do, and he's a handsome, redhead, redhead boy, 13 years old, and his name is Keller, which means little companion in Ireland. So tell us about life in Melrose growing up. Life in Melrose, it was, it was busy, it was fun. I had great parents. We, uh, my mother was an amazing woman. She, um, she always had a plate and a chair for somebody that we never knew probably. My father passed away. He was 47 when he passed away and I was 12 years old. It was a heartbreaker to me because I idolized him. He had a business of ice in the summer and oil in the winter and um, I would love to go out in the truck with him and um, I, I just uh, love being with him but um, the customers were very generous and uh, wanted to uh, give me treats and cakes and cookies and whatever. And when I got home, I didn't feel very much, very good, so my mother said, what's the matter? And I said, well, I ate too many delicious things. So after that, I wasn't allowed to go too often, but I really missed it because um, I, I idolized my father. And I think probably why because he was my father, and uh, my father had been married before, and his wife passed away and left two sons, and my mother had been married before, and uh, World War, in World War I, uh, she had a daughter, and her husband died before my older sister was born. So my mother had, uh, and father had uh, yours, mine, and ours from two marriages. And we had, a, we had a great family. We had a great family. My, both my parents were great. I just, my, my mother was amazing. I, I just, to this day, I thought to myself, why don't children understand when we're little and young? Why don't we understand that we should say thank you to our parents? Because we have no idea when we're young what it takes to be a, a good parent. Mm -hmm. And I had both. I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't ask for more. Okay. So Marion, uh, where did you go to school? Uh, I went to school in Melrose at the Winthrop School. It's a standing school still, and it's a beautiful school. And did you go to Melrose High School? Yes, I did. And while you were in high school, were you made aware of events happening overseas? Not really, mm -hmm. that, no, not as I recall, not really. Mm -hmm. Not too much in, until I got older, really. Okay. And when did you graduate from Melrose High School? 1943. Okay, so? I entered the service mm -hmm. in 1944, and uh, 44 to 45, and in 1945, World War II was over, mm -hmm. so, um, I went back home and uh, continued the job that I had previously with the New England Telephone Company. Okay. Let's uh, reel it back a little bit to when you were in high school. Uh, do you remember what happened when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, no, uh, I came home from school and everybody in our class cried. Everybody. We, it was just, it was, 
it was something that we just we couldn't understand. How could how could the Japanese people drop bombs on a on our ships and our people? It was it was devastating. It was devastating. It was the worst thing I ever heard in my childhood. Now, Marion, you were in high school during the early part of World War II. Uh, what do you remember about uh, like rationing or victory gardens? Oh, everybody had a victory garden. Everybody, and um, we used to have tokens, and they were red. They were smaller than a dime, and in order to uh, get nylon stockings, we had to have those tokens, and uh, we had a Kennedy's Butter and Egg store, and that's where we would get things that we needed there, and you needed it for, me for meat. And it was, um, I can remember, I, I asked my mother, what is the depression and what is, you know, what is this, this subject that they talk about in school? And she said, well, she said, a lot of people lost their jobs. They had hard times taking care of families. And uh, it, was, it was very depressing. And that's why it was called a depression. Mm -hmm. And um, when I asked her about it, uh, I said, well, I'm not depressed. And she said, no, you're not depressed. And she said, we're doing the best thing we can not to not be. Mm -hmm. Do you also remember rationing? Oh, I certainly do. Yes, you had to, uh, in, in order to get stockings, uh, meat, um, yeah, can, I think I'm repeating myself, but Kennedy's Butter and Egg Store, mm -hmm. we, we kept coupons down there to get peanut butter and good butter. Because I can remember going someplace with my mother, and they, rash, they had uh, bags of white stuff, and there was a red, there was a pill in it, it was red, and you had to squeeze it and squeeze it till that pill broke and made the white look yellow. Oleomargarine. Oleomargarine, right, right. Uh. Okay, let's get you back to 1943. You've graduated. What did you do immediately after graduation? Immediately after, I went to work for the telephone company. It was right across the street from the high school. Convenient. And when, uh, what made you decide to go into the military? Oh, I had a cousin, her name was Mary Carpenter, and she joined the Marines. I had cousins, Buddy, Tommy, I, I had a lot of cousins and relatives, neighbors and relatives that went in the military. And when I found out that my cousin Mary had gone in the Marines, I was gung-ho to find out all about it. So I asked her to write to me and I said, tell me all the bad things, because the good things come easy. And uh, we corresponded for quite a while, and um, I graduated in 43, and 44 I enlisted in the Navy. Now, why the Navy and not the Marines? I, I, I don't know why exactly, but it, the, the, the uniform had something to do with it. I didn't want to go in the Army. I didn't like their hats. <laughs> And by the way, where did your cousin serve? My cousin served out in San Francisco. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we won't give away what's going to be happening next, so we'll, uh, we'll get you uh, sworn in. Are you sworn in at Boston? Yes, I was. Okay. Yes, I was. And where did you go for basic? I went to uh, uh, Hunter College in the Bronx, New York. And I left my home December 28, three days after Christmas, to go to Hunter College, mm -hmm. the Bronx. And there was a res reservoir there. And when we were in our barracks and would go for classes, we had to march quite a distance. And we were housed right near a reservoir that was so freezing cold in December. And we would get, we would get hands chapped and our faces chapped. It was, it was, it was a tough boot camp. So Marion, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Was this your first time away from home? Yes. And what was it like kind of meeting all these other women from all parts of the country? I think we, I think myself, I was anticipating something amazing and scared stiff at the same time. It was, um, it, it was, I never regretted doing that. I mean, boot camp, it wasn't the great of things, but uh, because Marines drilled us when we did formations and we had to walk so far to get to classes, and it was, it was tough out there. And how long were you in boot camp? Honestly, I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember that. And what else uh, besides walking a lot did you do during boot camp? Oh, we had uh, uh, military history, all kinds of classes. Well, I'm, I wouldn't remember them now, but we had classes. We had uh, ex uh, gym. We had to go to gym, and um, I, I can't remember. I'm 93 now, and I can't go back that far with some <laughs> That's things. That's okay. <laughs> all right. And when did you get out of boot camp? Was it around March, April? I don't. I don't remember. Okay. I really don't remember. I think boot camp was like two, three months, more, okay. probably, probably about three months. So we're talking now late winter, early spring around that time? Mm -hmm. Around there. Yeah. Okay, and what rank did you get out uh, when you were out of boot camp? What uh, rank did you have? Oh, uh, seaman third class. Seaman third. And what were you, uh, I know you had a previous experience with, as being a telephone operator. Is that what you were doing in the Navy? <laughs> the one thing I didn't want to do was be a telephone operator. And at the time, my, my insignia on my sleeve was a specialist. They call it, the name word was specialist X, and it was cross keys. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, cro across, the, it looked like a cable oh, thing. Okay. Uh, and I, automatically, uh, if you're already trained to do something, you're going to do that in the, in the military because they don't have to train you. So it was the last thing I wanted to do, but I became an operator. Just uh, out of curiosity, if you were not a telephone operator, what did you want to be in? I wanted to put an option in to, that, that I would be able to go to dental school. Really? I wanted to be a dental hygienist. Okay, well, you're at the switchboard now. And where were you sent for your duty station after basic? Shoemaker, California. And where is that? It's probably 60 miles east of San Francisco. Okay, so now you're at the same coast as your cousin. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right. And Shoemaker was actually a fairly large facility, wasn't it? Was it was huge. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, CV base, uh, Shoemaker, where the, the Navy, the military were. And um, it, what, what the other one was, I forget now. But the, I believe it was a hospital? Yes, yes. thank you. Okay. Yes, it was a hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, Marion, for those of us who are much more used to iPhones, cell phones, tell us how to operate a switchboard. <laughs> it's very tiring. We sat elbow to elbow each other. We had what they called a, a box of numbers. They were little holes. It looked similar to the size of a Cracker Jack box. And there were plugs in front of us, probably about 25 at least plugs. And there were two in each in each section, and there were a hundred all told. And you take one in the hand where there was a light on the board, and you plug that in, and then you take the other hand and put what number they want into the with the other hand, and then you take your left hand and you have to sw blow, turn a switch back or forth, and if it was back, it would be, uh, um, an, oh, I forget now, back was one ring and forward was two rings. Okay, and first of all, how many operators were at the switchboard at any one time? Oh, I would say, 
I'd say 15 to 20 in the office where I worked. And you were handling phone calls for the entire base? Oh yes, oh yes, yeah. And what was your shift like? My shift? Yeah. Uh, we had three shifts around uh, seven to four, four to, or oh, whatever. I, I forget how those yeah. numbers go. Like a round robin. R round robin, exactly. Okay. Now, Marion, do you remember anything in particular from those days in uh, Shoemaker? I can only say I loved it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was very strange uh, weather-wise because uh, when the winter came, we had beautiful coats and um, we didn't have to use them because it really didn't get really cold. And in the summer, it was stifling hot and no air conditioning barracks. <laughs> and we, um, I worked in the, in the uh, communications office on the switchboard and uh, I, think this, I think the number of us was probably about 15. Okay. Now, uh, when you brought up the coats, it's just, uh, what kind of uniforms were you wearing? They were, um, I still have my uniform. No kidding. I have kept it because I was in World War II, and when I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, That's but okay. no. I, I re-enlisted in um, the Korean War, and I kept all my uniforms. So I was lucky to have them for the second mm -hmm. And what kind of uniform was it? Were you wearing whites or work? We wore navy blue jackets, navy blue skirts. Uh, we had white shirts for dress and blue shirts, dark blue shirts for work. If we were going to a, a, something outside or uh, it, like if you were going to a party and you're going off the base, you had to wear your, your, your uh, white shirt. And we had two different kinds of hat, an Eisenhower hat, and then another hat that they called the white cap. And you could take that white cap off because it'd get dirty and you have to wash it. But the other one was an Eisenhower, and it was the same navy blue. Okay. And horrible shoes. <laughs> they were like your grandmother wore. But I... they, were, they were comfortable. Okay. And uh, did you have any problems with stockings? Uh, yes, we had to buy them, and uh, they were hard to get. Oh, okay. Now let's get back to the switchboard. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the headset. They were horrible. A headset, I can try to describe it to you, on your, on your chest, right under your, your chin, you would have a, a um, triangle, triangle <laughs> shape, and it had two straps on it. You'd clip the strap here and then another one behind your back and around to this heavy thing in front of you which had a mouse a mouthpiece on it. And that would to talk to the person and then to hear the person for the call, you had a thing, a, it was horribly, it was had two, two wire things to go over your head and the thing to go over your ear was so heavy. Everybody, we all had headaches all the time. So uh, did you have any kind of social life when you weren't at the switchboard? What was this? Your social life, did you? Oh, we had wonderful times. Mm -hmm. When we weren't working, we had wonderful times. We had, actually, we had people come out. I can't remember his name, it began with R. Uh, um, ben, there was a girl and a boy about Mickey Rooney's age, yeah, mm -hmm. and they came out uh, and entertained us hmm. from Hollywood. We had great, great entertainment, and we would get on buses and go on trips into San Francisco. And the amazing thing about that was, we were shoemate. The California was country, and there was a lot of sheep farmers. And we went out off the base in the bus. Sometimes we'd have to wait for a farmer to go across the road with his sheep. Can you tell us a little more about what San Francisco was like back in those days? San Francisco to me was similar. Weather-wise, it's similar to Boston. And uh, it, it, it was it's very exciting. It has so much 
Chinatown was amazing. We went to uh, parks and uh, we had a great opportunity to do a lot of sightseeing and uh, great restaurants and uh, very, very interesting. And the oh, so old St. Mary's Church uh, every Sunday, every weekend rather, Saturday and Sunday, they had the church open in the basement and servicemen could go there for coffee and donuts. It was a very exciting place to be. The weather was great. Sometimes it was, uh, oh, I'll tell you about you know, something interesting, the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. Uh, we went to a building and uh, there was a, you could go out on a, on a veranda or something, a big, a big uh, place where you could stand and watch. And um, the, you could see, they said the fog rolls in and covers the Golden Great, great Golden Gate Bridge, and it truly did. It just totally disappeared. Okay, Marion, how long were you stationed at Shoemaker? 44 to 45. Um, remember what month, like May, June, July? No, I don't. I have them in a diary book, okay. but I don't recall. Oh, uh, let's put it. Do you remember when the war ended? Yes. We could not go off the base. We wanted to celebrate so bad, and we could not. If you were off the base, they let you stay off the base, but they had a time limit to get back in. But um, we, we celebrated. We had parties, and um, we, if, we, the telephone operators were very popular with the kitchen workers. So, uh, because if they wanted to make a call and we got one from Boston and the serviceman was from Boston that we knew, we hold that line and then connect that sailor. sailor. And uh, we, we just, I can't begin to tell you what a wonderful life I had out there. Mm -hmm. The barracks were great and uh, the waves, we, we ate in a different dining room than most of the sailors. Uh, they had a football team, and um, I can't remember the name of the team. I was in it. We had uh, guns, but they were painted white and dismantled. You couldn't shoot with them, and uh, we were like a drill team. Oh wow! And when the when the uh, when the football team went to compete with other teams, uh, there were about ten of us, I think, and we do we do. Uh, cadence and do, do uh, matching, drill things. That sounded like fun. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Okay. It was a lot of fun. So this is uh, 1945, the war is over, mm -hmm. and you, decide, uh, you decided to go back to Boston? I came home. You came home. And what was your rank at the end of the first round of uh, your service? I was a... Um, Oh, Were you still it? special? Uh, yeah, third. Was, uh, I can't remember that uh -huh. exactly now. What it looked like. I were you, were you still seaman third, or had you been oh, promoted? Oh, I, I was. Uh, I was second class. Then. Okay, seaman second. Seaman second. Because there's only. Uh, yeah. All right, and what did you do after you got home to Boston? I politely put my my clothes in the cleaners, my service unit clothes, and um, put everything in the closet, and I went back to work at the telephone company in Melrose. Okay, and uh, what was that like? I hated it. I loved military life. Uh -huh. <laughs> I did. Just kind of curious, why didn't you uh, stay in the military? Well, the war was over. Uh huh. Forty-five. So. Uh, I got discharged and they sent us to um, Balboa Park, I think it was in San Diego, to uh -huh. get you discharged. No, I, I didn't want to get out because when the Korean War broke out, I went right in again. Uh huh. So you were uh, in the telephone company for, during all that time. Yeah. And then when Korean War started, there I, you are. Yeah. I couldn't wait. <laughs> Okay, so back to Boston? 
back to, well, uh, no, I, yes, I went back to Boston, and I went into uh, South Boston where you uh, recruit and uh, sign up, and I signed up again. And um, I went, got was stationed at um, 50 to 53, I was stationed at um, the Brooklyn Shiplot Yard on Flushing Avenue in Brooklyn. And they, when I was si assigned there, I uh, worked in the supply department. But still on the switchboard. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. yes. What do you remember about your years out there? News. Well, uh, in general. Well, uh, what was in general? What was Brooklyn like in the early 1950s? Oh, it was uh, it was very exciting. We we could go off the uh, base and get a bus and go into um, San Francisco and go to movies. Go to you mean we'd do a lot of sightseeing. That was a long bus trip. Do you mean New York? <laughs> no, no, uh, no. Oh, Brooklyn. No, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm That's getting, okay. No, I'm getting mixed up with it. Back to no, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. We went into New York City. There yeah. we go. Okay. Give me a, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry about that. but no, um, Don't worry about it. 93 is catching up with me sometimes. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. So was there anything uh, during that time you were in the Brooklyn Shipyard, any stories you remember, any experiences? Well, we, what we did in the supply department was we shipped all the the uh, uniforms from New York to uh, Chicago, from women and men. As we were the supply department. You had to make your uh, requests through the supply department. For, for anything from a screwdriver to a, a uniform, the supply department took charge of that. And did you live on base or off? We lived in, uh, uh, in New York. We lived at St. Albans Hospital, Long Island, New York, because they didn't have any lodging for us in Brooklyn. There was no place where they could find to uh, keep us bedded down. So there was a hospital at St. Albans, and um, they renovated a place for us to live. So it was about an hour and a half train ride every day. We, and uh, at, at the New York, it was, uh, we ate morning, and um, we ate evening meal, and then we ate in Brooklyn for lunch meals. Okay. There wasn't much time to have a lot of fun, really. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was like civilian life. You get up, you eat your breakfast, you dress, you go out, and you come mm -hmm. back. So it was, a, it was a job just exactly like a civilian job. Uh -huh. And do you have, do you remember any, any story, any particular stories, any, um, anyone you worked with, anyone you lived with? Oh, I, there were so many. Uh, if you could, if you could, with your salary, and uh, the government would give you so much more, if you could find an apartment, you could live off the base, or St. Albans, where we did. And uh, because of St. Albans and the long trip, uh, that's where the, another woman, uh, she was a chief. She made, she was, had a, re, a very much higher than mine. And uh, I finally made first class. But um, she had a lot more money than I did. And uh, so we found an apartment. And then the, the uh, government gave us more to do it. And uh, so we lived right in Brooklyn. And uh, we, we could walk to work. It was great. It was super, yeah. And the landladies was, we've had two different apartments, and um, uh, the landladies that we had were very strict. They told us specifically that there would be no, over, no sleepover people in that apartment, and um, they had very strict, strict rules, but they had very nice apartments. And so it was a, an exchange of respect. Mm -hmm. Now, Mary, uh, night, early 1950s, you were seeing, everyone was seeing their first television. 
What do you remember about the first time you saw a TV? I came, my mother was working in National Radio Company in Malden, Mass, and uh, it, she worked on televisions. And uh, when I came home on leave, uh, my mother, everybody, every little young person in our neighborhood came to our house on Saturday morning because my mother got a television, a seven and a half inch television. And you could purchase to go with that a separate thing that you could put on the front of the TV and it would be a magnifying glass. And every young kid in the neighborhood came to our house on Saturday morning to see the cartoons. And my mother would make cocoa if it was cold weather or whatever, she'd fix something. So I, I, I've had an amazing life. You've had indeed. Well, let's get back to the end of your naval service. It's 1953, and Korea War, they signed the armistice. Mm -hmm. So you're, you, you went back to Boston? Well, no, I forgot something very important in between ah. here. Mm -hmm. I, um, my, my mother's maiden name was Mary Sheridan. Okay. And she married my father, George Carpenter. Mm -hmm. um, I met a sailor in Brooklyn. And uh, when you get, uh, have muster in the morning, they call off your name and you have to give them the number to let them know you're there. And I, my maiden name was Carpenter. And at the end of the alphabet, there was a young man who answered, was Sheridan with S. My mother's maiden name was Mary Sheridan and she married my father, George Carpenter. My husband's mother was Audrey Carpenter and she married Joe Sheridan. My name was Marion Carpenter and I married Joe Sheridan. And it was the best thing I did until I had my two amazing daughters. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about your husband. Uh, he was in the Navy. He was in the Navy. And what did he do? He was a journalist. He was a journalist. Mm -hmm. And he was on the Hobson, USS Hobson. And the Hobson was hit and went down. However, he, my husband, and two other sailors, they had human, what they call humanitarian leave because in the three cases, there was health problems in their family. And in my husband's, it was his mother. And uh, so the, the three that came home, they had, my husband had a very hard time uh, because all their, shipmate, his, their shipmates went down with the Hobson. And my husband, he, he suffered an awful lot from that. And I, sh I know the other two did too. Mm -hmm. you know. So he, uh, he, he couldn't sleep and it was, mm -hmm. took him a long time. And um, if he hadn't already, what was your husband's name? Joe Sheridan. Joe Sheridan. And when did you two get married? October 2nd, 1953. Okay. And were you, you were still in the Navy or were you out? We were in the Navy. You were still in yeah. the Navy. But my husband, mm -hmm. after we got married, my husband got orders to go out to sea. So uh, he asked me, he said, I, I wish you wouldn't stay in when I'm not there. So I, I was discharged and I went home and lived with my, with my family. Mm -hmm. Now, did you take advantage of the GI Bill in any way? We did. We bought our home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where was that? Tewksbury. Tewksbury, Mass. Mm -hmm. We bought it in September 8, 1961. And it just got sold a short time ago. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And did you, uh, when you uh, left the Navy for the second time, you were a seaman first, correct? Yes. Okay. Did you receive any accommodations or medals? Uh, what they give us is ribbons. Yep. And uh, so I have ribbons. Mm -hmm. I think I have. I think I have three or four, four. I know I have three. Okay. I think I have four. Mm -hmm. the, my the pins. 
All right. And what? Uh, and you went? Did you go back to the telephone company? Temporarily, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Until a while. The do your amazing daughters were born. Right. And what did your husband do for a living? My husband, uh, he worked. For, he was a teamster. He worked on the trucks, mm -hmm. uh, cross country. And did either of your daughters express any interest in joining the military? Not no. a bit. Not a bit. Marion, how important was it for you to serve in the military? I just, at the time, I had a cousin who, a woman who was in the Marines. I'd said that before, I think. And uh, a lot of my relatives, men, were going in the service. And uh, I, I, I went in, I enlisted, and I came home and I told my mother and she said to me, are you unhappy at home? And I said, no, I'm not unhappy at home. She said, well, why are you doing this? And I said, because everybody's doing something. And I said, you yourself are doing something. I said, you volunteer in a building, and she sewed military uniforms. So I said, everybody's doing something, and I wanted to do it. That's why I did it. OK, Marion, uh, over the past 70 years, the role of women in the military have changed oh. a great deal. And now you even have women serving in combat areas. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? I, I don't approve of that, really. Mm -hmm. I think there's so many other things that you can do, a woman can do in the military that I don't think we have to prove anything. I think we're women enough for the fact that we just did it anyway. Marion, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap things up? Yes. I, I, uh, I've had an amazing life. Mm -hmm. I'm very thankful to my mother for the things she taught me. And uh, I credit the military for a great training and uh, I've had, between my mother and the military, I've had the best life anybody could have. Okay. Well, I actually have one more thing. Uh, would you like to say a few words about the Bedford VA? I could fill a book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't been here very long, but uh, I can't praise the VA hospital enough. I have a, a room, a roommate. Uh, I have a roof, roof over my head. I sustained on fine food. I have no regrets, and I, I, it's my home. Mm -hmm. Well, Marion Carpenter Sheridan, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. You're quite welcome. <laughs>